Uh, uh, hi. Uh, oh, hey, how's it going? It's uh, it's the Verge Mobile Show where it's uh, it's our twenty first, and on your twenty first, you totally got a party, and so you should you should totally uh, stay tuned for the Verge Mobile Show. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dieter Baum. I'm Dan Seifert. And I'm Chris Sigler. And uh, to be very clear, I am stone cold sober, despite the fact that this is the 21st episode of the Virgin Mobile Show for the week of October 15th, 2012. Uh, I have to say, Dieter, your your head, Dan and I were just talking about this earlier, your, your head is like enormous. It's like, <laughs> that's really, really frightening. <laughs> I, um, you know, I have a big head. What, uh, what can I say? Say, uh. So, uh, would you say it was a big weekend news? I would say that it was bigger than I expected. Uh, we know that the end of the month is crazy, um, and it seems like it's just gotten started early. So we had lots and lots of rumors to the Nexus, the, uh, we had the LG, Sprint got bought, like, out of nowhere this week has been chock full of stuff to talk about. Yeah, it's, you know, I don't know what this leaves for CES. We were just talking about CES a second ago. And I guess, I mean, I guess CES is never a big show for mobile. I guess we'll see it start to pick up again at, at MWC uh, in late February. But, uh, yeah, this is going to be the biggest news cycle for mobile of the year in the next three to four weeks, I think. Yeah, it's going to be pretty insane. And it's, it seems like it's already starting. Whether you want it to or not, <laughs> yeah. it's coming. So why don't we jump into that? The uh, unwanted uh, thing. This is kind of crazy. Uh, this supposed LG Nexus device that has been fully exposed, given a complete revolt review treatment uh, before it's even been officially announced. And that's that kind of kind of insane, if you ask me. Well, I you yeah, know, it's crazy. This. The, I mean, you know, the software apparently is super buggy, and that's no surprise given that this is like a crazy leaked device. But, you know, if this does in fact turn out to be the Nexus, what uh, what blows my mind about it is how much it looks like the Galaxy Nexus. Like, we yes. were expecting it to be based on the, the LG Optimus G, but it looks like the Samsung. It really does. Well, it, what's what's kind of funny about that is the Galaxy Nexus was kind of, you know, in the vein of the Galaxy S2 at the time, but with a more rounded shape and more rounded corners. And like this is exactly the kind of the same thing with the 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 Optimus and this LG Nexus. It's in the vein of, you know, the Optimus G, but much more rounded. And so that it ends up looking almost exactly like the Galaxy Nexus. I think if you go all the way back to the Nexus S, you can tell that there is a certain aesthetic that Google is probably asking for from the OEMs that it's signing up for Nexus devices. Uh, and, and yeah, it certainly seems that that's continuing here. Yeah, so well, well, I mean, I think it looks fine. It, 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 I think it certainly looks better than the Optimus G, which, um, you know, is actually, actually, I've got them both here, uh, the at t and the Sprint. It's actually kind of a, a squat, square little phone, especially if you compare it to, say, the Galaxy Nexus or the um, the the One X. It's sort of, you know, I'm not going to call it stumpy, but it's it's a little bit shorter. It's a little bit closer. I don't know if it's exactly 4x3. I mean, I'm sure it's not, um, but it's not quite as tall. Um, and so that um, I think that putting sort of the Nexus styling on this hardware would make it really handsome. Yeah, I mean, the, the photos, and I mean, don't get me wrong, whoever, quote unquote, reviewed this device took some decent photos of it that uh, that potentially made it look better than it actually looks IRL uh, <laughs> in real life, for those of you who uh, who don't follow the internet lingo. But uh, um, yeah, no, it, it looks like a, like a pretty attractive... Uh, device. I don't know. I, you know, I think I commented last week that my Galaxy Nexus feels huge after using an iPhone 5, and I'm not sure I want a phone. That, like, just give me a four-inch neck. Like, give me a modernized Nexus S. Right. You know. Exactly. And I think uh, if Vlad were here, he would be uh, screaming from the mountains in agreement with you. Yes. 
Uh, you know, it's funny that you mentioned the iPhone 5 because I feel like every single phone I've picked up in the past two weeks since I started using my iPhone 5 has felt like a heavy brick. Um, yeah. So there's there's kind of that. Now, as far as the the hardware of this LG Nexus, obviously it's very uh, uh, pre-release at this point and, you know, it's, it's definitely doesn't seem like a finalized device, but the hardware more or less seems like it's kind of in the vein of what it's going to be. Uh, and if this thing launches with eight gigabytes of internal storage, I just can't imagine using that as, you know, a Nexus device. Um, if you, you know, load three games on there, you can suck up, you know, 50% of your, your internal storage right away. Um, so, I mean, I guess uh, Google could tentatively or theoretically offer this in multiple capacities. But uh, it seems kind of odd to me that they're starting it at eight gigabytes, uh, eight gigabytes of internal. Yeah, that's nothing. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned about the fact that we haven't seen, we saw the HSPA version, but not uh, an LTE supporting version on at t go through the FCC. We actually got an email from a listener who was uh, talking about the, you know, the rumors that there might be multiple Nexus devices. And, um, you know, he's a little bit worried that what's going to happen is that, you know, you're not going to get your choice of Nexus on your choice of carrier that, you know, you're going to get stuck in a situation where like Verizon will get the HTC Nexus and AT and T will get the LG Nexus, and you know there'll be multiple devices and multiple carriers, but it'll still you're still going to be stuck in this this weird world where you know you have to pick a carrier, and then that totally limits what phone you can get. I could completely see that happening. As cynical as it sounds, I could I could totally see that happening. Just you know, given the the incompatibilities uh, between the networks for LTE service. Yeah, I I, I don't think that. Google or anybody uh, really has the power to uh, to pull off this coup where they have all of these Nexus devices, this X number of Nexus devices, however many we end up seeing, deployed on all four national networks in the U.S. The odds of that happening, I think, are practically nil. That would be amazing if it did happen, but I'm certainly not counting on it. I'm, I'm not that much of an optimist. Um, um, well... I mean, it's coming soon, uh, and I'll, I'll be interested to see if we do get multiple. I mean, wasn't there a rumor that there was a Sony device that uh, maybe it was a Nexus device? Yeah, um, but... those pictures. I don't know, man. <laughs> they're those, they're pretty rough. <laughs> yeah, those those, yeah. those pictures were were not uh, did not have me convinced. And we mentioned in our post that like the screen is not aligned correctly. The bottom of the of the screen is is I think four pixels more to the right than the top of the screen. And don't get me wrong, if it's like an early prototype, I could certainly imagine that like the components are kind of shoddily put together, but still, that's uh that's a red flag. Yeah, and you if you look deep or close at the, the back, you can see some evidence of uh, image alteration. So uh, it'd be great if Sony did a Nexus, Nexus phone. I think uh, a lot of people would be really excited about that. But uh, whether the one that we saw this week or allegedly saw this week uh, is it, I'm not terribly convinced. Now, what's interesting to me is that we haven't heard, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm probably, I probably have no idea what I'm talking about, but I don't think we've heard a single rumor of a Samsung, a next generation Samsung Nexus device. Is that correct? And and, That's not what I've heard, yeah. and and so I think what has happened is Samsung uh, is is feeling very confident about its <laughs> position in the Android world right now and feels like it doesn't necessarily need uh, Google's help anymore to do what it wants to do um, and that has certainly borne out with the Galaxy S3 and the S2 before it really and the Note and Note 2 uh, so I you know makes me wonder if we're ever going to see a Samsung Nexus again I feel like. The, the Nexus is sort of the safe haven for downtrodden OEMs that want to, <laughs> that want to do something cool on Android and, and need Google's help and guidance and, uh, you know, their, their, uh, their muscle to make carriers carry it. Um, and Samsung simply doesn't need that help anymore. Uh, no, they've taken Android not. and made it their own, and now it's going to be somebody else's turn. And LG certainly, I think falls into the category of downtrodden Android OEM. Yeah, LG and, you know, HTC as well. Even yeah. though HTC has had some really impressive devices this year, it's still having trouble actually selling them and, and turning a profit on them. So yeah. um, having Google's help behind it like it did way back when with the Nexus One certainly wouldn't be a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the Nexus One, I mean, for, for many people, the Nexus One is still, like, the ultimate Nexus device, you know? Like, if... if yeah. If, if the Nexus One had a 720p display and LTE, I would probably still consider carrying it to this day. 
<laughs> not, never mind. It's 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 512 megabytes of storage. Yeah, never. So yeah, you, yeah, you yeah. couldn't install any yeah. apps. Or... I'm glossing over that stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean the Nexus one was was pretty great. Yeah, and, uh, it was it was it was one of the first Android phones, definitely that took a lot of people's focus off of the iPhone as far as you know a high end phone that can really compete. Um, and and that's what it defined the Nexus line going forward, yeah. which hasn't always fulfilled that. Um, I think uh, the Nexus S was kind of a misstep, but the, the Galaxy Nexus was a lot better. But um, So hopefully, if we do get four of these or more than one of these Nexus devices, um, we're not going to get like a, a low, medium, and high uh, type of thing, but we're going to get high-end versions from all of them, uh, all the manufacturers that participate. That would be kind of great. Um, but yeah. it's still, we're still going to have to wait a few weeks to find out exactly what happens, I think. So let's um, let's talk about the uh, the Optimus G. I reviewed the uh, the Sprint and the AT and T version, and I mean, really, the most interesting thing is that you know LG has got uh, you know a flagship top tier phone on a couple of U.S. carriers instead of just you know shipping low and mid range stuff and, and that. Um, I'm not even admitting that the LG intuition exists uh, <laughs> in that assessment, <laughs> um, but like they're good. Um, the screen is incredibly good and, and, and surprisingly nice. I, I think it's second in the Android space only to the One X in terms of its viewing angles, its brightness, its color fidelity. Um, I'm really happy with it. Um, and I'm holding up the, uh, the Sprint version now, which matches very closely to uh, you know, the international hardware with the exception of a, a sealed SIM card, which is pretty annoying. Um, and like, it's, I keep saying like, it's not the like, prettiest phone in the world, but it's, you know, it, it's fine. It's, it's pretty good. And then the LG's thing is they've got, I, I'm trying to get this to have it on the camera, but I can't. So the back panel, which is glass, I think, but it could be poly in one glass in another. Like LG has told some people that it's not glass and everybody else that it is. So I don't know why they can't just have the story straight, but the deal is, is that it's actually polarized. And so if you're looking at it at an angle, it looks like it's black. And then once you get straight on, then you can see that, you know, the pattern finish underneath, which reflects the light in a certain way. Um, so you get a black slab, but then you get this Julie looking thing when you're looking at it at the right angle, um, which is kind of neat. That, that pattern um, totally reminds me of the original live wallpaper on the Nexus one with the, uh, the lights I, that, I, I mean, the, 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 the squares and then the, the different colors that would shoot horizontally and vertically. Yeah. That's what it totally just, I mean, if, when I first saw that, that was like the first thing I thought of. I can see that. And then the, uh, the AT&T version is a little bit wider, actually, because it's got like this like curved rail on it. And uh, the deal is that accommodates the uh, SIM card and a micro SD slot. Uh, but otherwise, they're basically the same. And um, it's so fast. It's got this S4 uh, Pro uh, processor from Qualcomm. It's a, a quad-core device or a quad-core processor. Um, and, like, everything is really fast except uh, screen rotation, which is LG software's fault, which takes basically, you know, 20 minutes for it to rotate the screen. <laughs> um, like, it's, like, but other than that, like, I don't know why that's so terrible because everything else is really good. Um, although I do need to – I spent a long time talking about this in the review um, – Somebody needs to take AT&T behind the woodshed and make them stop putting crap on phones. The, the amount of, like, there's 11, like, AT&T apps that are crammed onto this thing. I stuck them all in a folder. Uh, AT&T Code Scanner, AT&T Family Map, AT&T Locker, AT&T Navigator, AT&T Ready to Go, AT&T Smart Wi-Fi, Live TV, My AT&T, Messages, YP Mobile, and Device Help. On top of that, that's like insane. you know, just some of the extra stuff that they did, like there's you know this quick setting thing in the notification area, and like they don't let you put mobile hotspot in there. Really? Why? What's the problem? Why are you afraid of mobile hotspot in quick settings? That doesn't make any sense. Oh, I can tell um, you exactly why they're afraid of of mobile hotspot in quick settings because they they want to discourage oh. anything. They it, it's for this the exact same reason that they're trying to discourage people from using FaceTime over cellular. They're they're deathly afraid, as they should be, of their <laughs> of their glass network shattering. That that that's what's going on here. Well, that stinks. <laughs> <laughs> so so is the is the software situation 
the uh, uh, the main or only explanation for the slightly lower score on the AT and T version? Uh, yeah, I mean the, the software is uh, annoying enough that uh, I, I had to give it a lower score on yeah. AT and T. Um, it, it just like it was just too much. Uh, the other interesting thing is AT&T's camera is 8 megapixels, where Sprint's is 13, and I much prefer AT&T's camera. Um, I was talking to uh, Mary Morgan Engadget. She prefers the 13 megapixel camera, and honestly, I think the difference is just, like, one of, like, pure ability. I think with both of these cameras, you need to do a little more work and be a little bit better at taking photos from a phone than you do with, say, the Galaxy S3 or the iPhone. Um, so you can get good shots out of these, uh, but you can't just, you know, hold the phone up and click something the way that you can on the other phones. You need to, you need to spend a little bit more time. Um, and in that sense, Sprint's uh, 13 megapixel camera is much less forgiving of, you know, my shaky hands and uh, terrible ability to frame shots and check the lighting and whatever. Yeah, once you get above eight, I, I feel like it's definitely a gimmick thing. Like either the carrier or the OEM was like, we just want to have this giant number on our spec sheet and blow everyone away. And it's, it's not, I mean, this is an age old, an age old argument, right? That the fact that when it comes to cameras, particularly camera phone cameras, uh, it's much more about the optics and about the quality of the sensor than it is about the, uh, the raw pixel count, because you're not going to blow up an image from your Sprint Optimus G to <laughs> poster size. I mean, maybe you are, I'm not. You don't know what people I mean, do, man. Yeah. <laughs> when I when I think about this argument, I, you know, I think about you know, I've got a, I think it's two years old now, a Canon S ninety five, which I deeply love, um, and I, you know, I fundamentally believe that we could have camera phones that hit that quality. I mean, let's talk about the pure view, right? Um, but if you can't get there yet, I think that wow, it is so hot in here. Uh, I think that. Um, you know, you should stick with what works for the majority of people. And right now that's an eight megapixel sensor. Yeah. Heck, I'd take five. If it meant that I had better low light sensitivity, I would actually be more than happy to take a five megapixel sensor. The problem is that I think that because eight is widely perceived as the standard for high end camera phones right now, you'd have a very difficult time coming to market with a five and convincing people that you're not shortchanging them on a, on a key spec. So I yeah. think, you know, that that's just a non-starter. Um, I just want to point out, uh, and nobody is going to have any idea what I'm talking about, but the the NFC logo on the at t model, which I'm assuming has something to do with ISIS, um, looks... Ex- double- uh, sorry? So bad. It's this weird double N. Yes, and it looks exactly like the, Nes- the Nespresso logo. <laughs> go, ahead, go ahead and Google that and, uh, and be ready to agree with me. It looks exactly like it. Somebody is suing somebody. Yeah. Yeah, that is um, hideous. So we, uh, we we finally got price and release date yesterday for both Sprint and at and I actually need to update the review with, uh, I think, at and information. They're both 199 on contract. Uh, Sprint's releasing on the 11th. at and is releasing on the 2nd. Um, and why couldn't they just have said this when they, like, announced and made the big releases of the phones at MobileCon, like, last week? What what's the whole why wait a week? This this whole thing about we're gonna announce the phone but not give you official price and release date. I'm, I'm tired of it. Motorola did the same thing with the Razer HD, HD Max. Um, everybody's doing it lately, and you know it's is it. I, I'm starting to think that it's not that like they can't do it. I'm starting to think that they know that if they don't do it, that we're going to be forced to write about them again. They'll get, you know, they'll get it up there once they announce the price and release date, you know, a little bit later. That's interesting. I have another theory, uh, which I I would like to run by you guys. I think that it's a domino effect created by Windows Phone 8. I think that Microsoft um, put pressure, not put pressure, just flat out said to OEMs and carriers that they can't talk specific dates and prices until their launch event on the 29th and then carriers were like well we want to plan all these other launches of of flagship devices around those windows phone 8 launches so we just kind of have to i mean like we we want people to know about them that we want people to know that we're getting them but we we want some wiggle room to play with those dates so they're kind of in a holding pattern until they can talk uh dates for the windows phone 8 gear I would I would agree with that theory, except that none of this behavior is terribly new. 
Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, carriers and manufacturers have been doing this for a long time. Yeah. And, and I, well, I feel like it's particularly bad. It is. It this is. Fall. This, this, partic- this fall has been particularly frustrating. But I think a lot of that does have to do with the Windows Phone stuff because a lot of the phones that we've covered recently and have been announced have been Windows Phone devices that were just like, oh, here's another phone. It's coming to T-Mobile. Can't tell you when. Can't tell you how much. Right. Right. So, uh, yeah, it seems like it's 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 been exacerbated, but uh, I, I don't think any of it is is new behavior necessarily. No, no, yeah, I mean, this has been going on for years. I just think that like we've had like what probably somewhere between five and ten phone announcements in the past six to eight weeks that have all had this mysterious you know pricing and availability availability to be announced in the coming weeks at the end, and it's just it's super frustrating, not just for us, but for readers who are trying to plan their purchases and trying to decide what they want to buy and when, and it's just, you know. I need to say one more thing about uh, the Optimus G, and that is, as great as it is that LG has sort of like come into its own and found its own identity as, as far as hardware goes, in terms of software, um, and also their launch party at MobileCon, uh, they have huge Samsung envy. It's ridiculous. They like their special features. There's there's Q Slide, which lets you uh, put this alpha and make video semi transparent, so you can text and watch video at the same time or do other stuff in the OS <laughs> video. They've got uh, I think it's called Wise Screen or something. That that where, just cracks me up. Continue, yeah. but I'm just sorry. I had to, I had to say that. The, the camera watches your eyes, just like you know the Samsung thing, so that it will the screen will stay awake while you're looking at it. They have the same, <laughs> you can do stuff just by tilting the phone instead of dragging and dropping um, in like random places, like moving an icon on the home screen. Nobody wants to do that. I don't know why Samsung insists on, on offering that option and then LG just does the same thing. They offer it again. I really wish um, they had a feature called L voice. <laughs> that, I mean, <laughs> I, I would be shocked if it didn't happen. It's like Y screen is like, they looked at the smart screen feature, looked at its name, opened up a thesaurus. It was like, we'll call it that. Yeah. I mean, and it's, it's like the same exact feature. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Dieter, but it's like the same exact feature. Right. And it, and it just like, I hate to say this, but it just makes LG terribly feel like a poor man's Samsung. Because like yeah. everything is just like trying to do what Samsung is doing, but it's not really pulling it off as well. Right. They don't need to do that. Like this is a good phone on its own, and so this is why it makes me super excited for the uh, whatever we're going to call the next uh, Nexus Nexus Four. I think is one of the rumors. Um, I mean, it, it looks great. I, I think it'll be really good because LG has managed to put together some really solid hardware here. But but this is uh, this is messed up because these phones. <laughs> The, the, these two Optimus Gs are coming to market uh, in in early November, which is right around the time that we think that this Nexus stuff is going to happen. So it, you're going to have this this train wreck, this collision of of two very different philosophies, both LG branded products, and you're going to have this mix of carriers. I mean, you know, is is the Nexus Four, whatever it's called, going to be offered on AT and T and or Sprint? I would assume it's going to at least be offered on Sprint because Sprint has been very very pro Google going back to the, uh, the Nexus one, which was canceled at the last minute, but then they ended up offering the S and the, the galaxy Nexus. Um, and you know, they're, they're very tightly partnered with Google on Google wallet. Um, so how is that going to play out? What is the message that they're going to deliver, uh, to customers who are cross shopping these products? I don't know. Well, I think you have different customers shopping these products is what it is. And and just like uh, as it's always been with Nexus devices, they're not huge sellers. They're not huge market share grabbers. Uh, somebody who's walking into a carrier store in the mall to buy their cell phone isn't going to look for the Nexus on display. Uh, they're going to see flashy software features and things like that. And whatever, you know, the um, sales reps are incentivized to sell at the time. Uh, so I think I, I think that, you know, if... If LG is able to deliver these uh, without bugs and 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 deliver them t- pr- uh, timely, as it seems that they're they're more or less doing, uh, they could sell a good amount of them. Uh, maybe even more so than a Nexus device, because the the people that are looking for a Nexus device are going to be very different. Yeah, yeah, they're going to have to have to be very careful about that messaging in the store in the store, though, because you you always I mean there's there. There are always two aspects, right? There's the PR line, there's the official company line and how this product is positioned and who it's being sold to. And then you have the very, the often very different message of what the sales rep is actually saying to the customer yeah. in the store. Uh, and historically, I mean, the, the, the thing that all of these OEMs, particularly Microsoft and, and their partners, but, but everyone has been fighting for the past 
couple years on Verizon and AT&T is, uh, you, you know, you're fighting the reps that are saying just buy this iPhone. Um, but now, you know, what are they going to say? say? Just say this is a purely hypothetical situation, but say that Sprint ranges both the Optimus G and then also ranges the, the Nexus 4, which for all practical purposes looks like a slightly nicer Optimus G, also by LG, uh, and the software, like from, from like, you know, completely uninitiated customer's perspective, it just looks like different software, not better, right? Like if you right. put them side by side in, the, side in the store, you can't say, oh yeah, this Nexus software is obviously better. Like, you, have, you know, you have to use it and then make the call for yourself. Um, I just don't know how they... I mean, that's a very complicated question that these carriers have to answer. Well, it, it, I think it, it's funny. It goes back to some of these software features that LG and Samsung are customizing their 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 phones with. A lot of these look really flashy in the store. When a uh, you know a sales rep is demoing a phone and is like, "Oh, look, you can watch a video and text at the same time," they're not saying that you'll never do that in real life. <laughs> yeah. uh, they're saying, "Look at how cool that is," and you know, and 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 look how I can tilt the phone and drag an icon around and stuff like that. Yeah. Whereas you know, actual features that are usable uh, in Day to day use um, aren't necessarily as whiz bang and, and flashy to someone who's buying something in the store. Right. So I think if you know, and, and it may very well come down to this, if you know, sales reps are incentivized to sell some uh, the uh, Optimus G line more, they're going to show it off more, and they're going to yeah. show off the things that it does more, uh, in, and they're going to they show in a favorable light those types of things that, yep. that sell the phone in the store. Yep. So, I have nothing else to say. About so, the, so wait, so, 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 Dieter, so Dieter, what's what's the final verdict? Should should a Sprint or AT and T customer strongly consider buying this phone in early November? No, you should wait and see <laughs> if you're going to get the this. Like that's it. Um, and if you're on um, AT and T, um, I think the Galaxy S three is a slightly better phone, unless you care deeply about not having an AMOLED screen. Um, you know, it's slightly faster, but there's not it's not that much faster. There's not that much that takes advantage of the, the, the processor on this thing in terms of software. Um, so, like, it's it's weird. Like, this is a really good phone that I probably am not going to recommend to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's sad how often we say <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and it's happening more and more often now. So, yeah, but, yeah. Which is a good thing. It means that they're making better products, um, but it's also making it much more difficult for the best products to, to bubble to the top and, and stand up. And you also feel bad. I mean, you can't help but feel a little bad for LG because, you know, they're trying. <laughs> <laughs> they're trying really I hard. I will say this. Uh, the Optimus G is like, like uh, Dieter was saying in the beginning, is the first, one of the first uh, that... LG is getting on Sprint in a long time as far as a high-end device, but it's also one of the first high-end devices that the company has released that's actually making it to the U.S. market in a timely fashion. Yeah. Um, yeah. The Optimus LTE took months and months and months to get to the U.S. market. Uh, the LTE 2, the same exact thing. The 4X HD, I don't think we're seeing it in the op in the um, U.S. market at all. And the uh, you know the view and the intuition that took nine months to get to the u.s market uh whereas these ones are they're coming out they're high end they're still high end when they get to the u.s so i think that's a big step for lg that they've been able to to accomplish that at least yeah plus at their uh, their launch party at the uh, the roof of the hard rock uh, hotel in san diego they um they put a woman in a mermaid outfit and put her in the hot tub <laughs> <laughs> and like i had to go to this thing in order to get her <laughs> I, I had to go to this thing. <laughs> it reminds me of it reminds me of like it reminds me of when I tuned in to the uh the live stream of the uh the Galaxy Note 2 launch event and there was just some buster like doing like card tricks and I'm like well, what is with co these companies and their non sequiturs at these like this has nothing to do with any like why is this happening right now? And I'm sure that the th the same thing was going through your mind Dieter. Like why is this happening to me right now? Like why is there a mermaid in this pool? <laughs> yeah. um, uh, the other, the other uh, Samsung Envy thing that I forgot to mention, I'm going to see if I can get the, uh, the audio for us right now, but I have to take my unlock pattern off the, uh, the screen in order to do it. So, I mean, listen, listen to this. Oh, you hear man. That? Oh, man. Dude, do it again. I mean, yeah, that's Samsung Envy. That, that yeah. is the inspired by nature... Yeah. Water droplet that everyone is such a big fan of. Yep. 
Yeah. Also, it uh, makes me want to uh, want to pee a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so I just turned on the uh, the video of our, our very own podcast feed, so I could uh, see uh, this thing that Chris mentioned about my giant head. And yeah, it's it's a big giant head between you two. It's really nice to see you in the studio, Chris. And this didn't get mentioned on the show last week, so if you only listen to the audio version of uh, the mobile show, you don't know this, but. Dan has grown an amazing beard in like, it's, record time. It's really lush. It's, yeah, it's, all right. <laughs> it's really it lush. Needs, it's, it still needs a little work. Uh, <laughs> I'm still in the, you know, looks like he's trying to grow a beard scruff scruff stage, I think. No, it, it looks like the, you know, I'm a rugged, like, I might be a lumberjack kind of like, <laughs> you know, like, uh, you, you don't know my story, but like, I'm definitely mysterious and rugged. I, I really should have worn some flannel or, or some plaid <laughs> today, I guess. <laughs> it's a good look. Well, thank you, guys. I, wow. Okay, sorry. I had to mention that, and now I have no transition, but we got to talk about uh, SoftBank, basically, whether they bought 70% of Sprint. Yeah. They're buying, okay, so they're buying a 70% stake, and what they're going to do is they're going to form a new company called New Sprint that's going to own <laughs> all of Sprint. Really creative <laughs> name, by the way. <laughs> yeah. That's the best they could come up with. <laughs> I, I was like this deal is surreal to me. Like I get that Sprint like straight up needs capital because they're not building their LTE network as quickly as they need to right now in order to stay competitive. So like I get that. What I don't get is um, SoftBank. Like me, I mean, I'm not very smart about Japanese carriers, but I mean, is it is is you know Sprint that good of an opportunity that they want to drop? Uh, how much was it? Six hundred? No. Uh, 12 billion. Yeah. You have to wonder why they didn't. I mean, I'm assuming that if they had gone to DT, they probably could have like, you know, they, they probably could have talked about a deal for T-Mobile USA. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, you, like I, I'm, I'm really curious about the specifics of the conversation that occurred uh, between Sprint and SoftBank and whether SoftBank approached, uh, anyone else because I, I'm, I'm totally on board with you. It's it's an interesting deal. Uh, and I, I'm sure that there are, you know, SoftBank is a company, you, you, you know, you look at their comments uh, from the, uh, from the press conference and it's very, very clear that this is a company that really wants to be recognized as like a global, like they want to be the next Vodafone, right? They want to have presence yeah. on every continent uh, and they, they want to grow aggressively. And they joked about like acquiring Docomo, at some point, which I thought was, <laughs> was funny. Um, and also like a really, like you, you would never hear, I don't think you would ever hear an American CEO joke about acquiring another company, like, because they just instantly get arrested by the SEC. <laughs> like you, you're just not allowed to do that. Um, so I thought that was funny, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting deal. I'll, I'll be very curious to see where this leads and it all, you know, I mean, Sprint has been looking, I love Dan Hesse. Dan Hesse is a great guy. Uh, he's just, he's just like, I don't know if he if he's actually an effective CEO or not, but he he certainly he talks like he doesn't BS like he, he doesn't like he's a very straight talker. Uh, and I think that that's a very important quality for a CEO of a somewhat downtrodden company to have. Uh, and uh, I, I they've they, they've been a vi in many cases over the past several years. They've been a victim of circumstance and, of course, a victim of the terrible uh, Nextel acquisition that almost uh, deep six the, the company altogether, which Dan Hesse was not a part of. He came in after that deal was was finalized. Um, so maybe this is just the break that Sprint needed to really finally turn their luck around for good. We'll see. Yeah, I mean it is a, a huge influx of cash, and um, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of analysis and speculation going on since then, uh, since this was announced or, or made official, I guess you could say. Um, and you know, it, it it was it's hard to see what Sprint was do, was going to plan to do before, um, uh, as far as its LTE network rollout. A lot of it seemed to still hinge on Clearwire, and you know, relying on that that 2.5 gigahertz spectrum. And it'll be interesting to see what Sprint does with this money, this newfound wealth that it has from SoftBank. Will it try to pursue purchasing? 700 megahertz uh, licenses, which is essentially buying them from other carriers that already own them, or is it going to try and take that 2.5 gigahertz spectrum that it has access to that nobody else is really using and spending the, the insane capital needs to uh, turn that into an actual usable nationwide network? Um, so it'll be interesting to see how Sprint plays this out, I think. 
Yeah. Um, I, I really can't comment too much about how this is going to help SoftBank because I'm just not intimately aware of uh, the Japanese uh, carriers' uh, financial situations and things like that. Um, but uh, you know, I imagine you know, they they saw Sprint as an opportunity to uh, that is a company that's kind of been down on its luck, but it has been sort of turning things around. Uh, but it needed some help, so. Uh, and uh, I guess SoftBank saw an opportunity to, to, to make some money with it. I really think it's just a prestige thing for them. I really do. Like I, like I said before, I, I think they're, they're hell-bent on becoming a global brand. And Sprint was uh, a really like clear and present opportunity for them because this was a company that, you know, they've kind of been like looking to be a quite that, you know, it, it's, it's readily apparent to anyone who's been paying any attention to this for the past probably two, two and a half years that they've. They've been dipping their toe in the acquisition waters. Like they've definitely been open to discussions with people. Uh, so that opportunity was there. But yeah, I mean, like we were saying before, why they didn't uh, talk to or why they didn't end up acquiring T-Mobile instead, I don't know. It's entirely possible that they had those discussions and they ended up deciding that Sprint was the better value. I, I don't know. I just hope that uh, Sprint is able to use this money quickly to beef up their LTE network and you know even their 3G network. I would I would really like to see them compete and get on par with Verizon and AT and T when it comes to having uh, 4G LTE uh, in the U.S. Uh, you know broadly and deeply uh, with really good speeds because. Like, I, I really think that more competition in that space would be great. And, you know, Sprint's overall strategy of being the nice guy, of offering unlimited data, of, <clears throat> you know, being a nice guy, uh, letting Google Lot exist on their network. <laughs> um, it's easy to be that when you're, you know, the loser. Uh, but when you actually start competing, if they can hang on to that nice guy philosophy, um, I think it would be really good for the market. And we'll finally get press releases that have uh, actual dates attached to when the LTE will be available. <laughs> oh, that, that's crazy talk, Dan. Don't, <laughs> don't get all crazy on me. <laughs> so this, this coming month stuff. Yeah. Do we want to talk about the Galaxy S3 Mini? Didn't we talk? Am I, am I completely insane or did we talk about the Galaxy S3 Mini last week on the show? Yeah, I think the well, only we, thing we, it was rumored. It, we didn't have a final oh, right. announcement. We right. our show okay, was right so. before the actual announcement. The announcement was the next day, uh, and the announcement fulfilled all of our concerns. Uh, <laughs> it, it solidified all of our worries <laughs> in that this was going to be a total uh, disappointment and uh, a yet another just run of the mill mid range smartphone that Samsung cranks out seemingly every other minute. Um, and, yeah. and and there's there's really nothing to get excited about here, which is hugely disappointing because I think the whole industry was like. It's got a Galaxy S3 name in it. It's going to be high powered, but it'll still fit in my hand. And um, you know, it's it, that's not the case in the least bit. So here's what I think is going on with this device. Um, I, I I think that certain very influential European carriers went to Samsung and said, "Hey guys, we have a lot of customers who identify with the Galaxy S brand and identify with Samsung and want to own a Galaxy S3." But they're, you know, they're not quite there income-wise. You have this huge opportunity to range a device with us that keeps the Galaxy S3 name, but it's down specced. And you know, let's make this happen. And Samsung, you know, as usual, is like, oh, okay, sounds good. <laughs> sounds like so, you've got all these Galaxy <laughs> S Advance parts lying around, you know? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. So, so I, you know, I don't think that they <laughs> hesitate, particularly because this is a somewhat limited release device i don't think that they hesitated to recycle the galaxy s name which is something that uh for the at least the past year and a half or two years they've kind of shied away from doing they've tried very hard i think to keep the galaxy s name at least focused on the high-end product the galaxy is used everywhere like yeah there's... well that's their android brand I, I think tom warren actually said this best he uh, he, he tweeted out that what Samsung has done is the equivalent of taking a, an iPhone 4 and branding it an iPhone 5 mini. It's totally bizarre. Like, th this should not be called an S3. I, it's ridiculous. Right. Yeah, I mean, the, the only thing that it shares with it is its general shape. Uh, everything else yeah. is different as far as the screen, the camera, the processor, the internals, uh, you know, front to back are different. And it uh, it doesn't support LTE. I would be shocked if we ever saw this thing in the U.S. Uh, for, for that reason alone. Um, but, you know, it might pop up with a variation, a carrier variation that has LTE for, you know, 50 or 100 bucks uh, with some weird name that, you know, yeah, will be it, yet another forgettable. That, that's device. exactly it. Like, this is going to end up being called, like, 
the Galaxy Conquest LTE. <laughs> and and that might be a real product, by the way. I don't know. And then it's going to launch on Sprint, and, like, three people will buy it. And, like, we might write a news post about it. We certainly aren't going to review it. And no one will, it, like, it will disappear in three months. That is what this keeps is what happening. Samsung is going to troll you. They're going to call it the Galaxy. <laughs> oh man! I'm telling you right now, the Mega Mini. That's what it's the, gonna the be. The Mega Mini. We, yes. need, we need to make Mega happen. That that needs to take off. <laughs> Wait, I, I hold, I'm looking up. I, I have a sneaking suspicion that there is a Galaxy Conquest. Well, there's a victory. Okay. Oh, there's a okay. there's an Android game called Galactic Conquest. Very close. Yeah, I guess there's no. Okay, so uh, carriers, there's an idea for you, Galaxy Conquest. <laughs> I'll bet you there's a Galaxy Victory. There is uh, on Sprint, yeah. the Galaxy Victory yeah. 4G LTE or something like that. Yes, yes, there is. Okay, so Conquest is pretty close to Victory. Anyway, um, so let's talk uh, Galaxy Note 2 on Sprint, October 25th for two ninety nine ninety nine. I we just there it is. I I mean, what else? You, <laughs> well, what else? What? What else do you want to say? It's I, coming to Sprint. It's it's coming to Sprint, but so I I actually just got my first opportunity to touch a Note 2 last week. Um, I sat down with T-Mobile, um, and they showed me a Note 2, and, like, y you can't appreciate in pictures how flipping big <laughs> this thing, like, it is, like, it is hilariously large. Like, I have it here. Well, I left it at home. I don't have it here to show uh, against other phones. Yeah, it's gigantic. It, just, it Like, in pictures, it just looks like a Galaxy S3. You're like, oh, whatever, that looks pretty cool. But no, it's, <laughs> yeah. like, it's huge. <laughs> But like, no, do not be confused. Yeah. This is a monstrosity. I mean, and that's fine. I mean, like the Galaxy Note sold very well. I'm sure the Note 2 will as well. But don't like don't buy it thinking that you're getting a Galaxy S3 with like a couple extra tenths of an inch of screen real estate. You're not. You're getting like a small tablet. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, in, in Vlad's review, he like he aggressively refers to it as a tablet instead of talking about it as a phone or a phablet or whatever else you'd want to call it. Yeah. Right, which which bothers me to no end because of the, the lack of actual tablet apps. But yeah. I, I think I made that point last week. So, right, but it's got Can the S Pen. Uh, it does have the and it's got Snow. Yeah, uh, excuse me, S, S Note. S -note. <laughs> <laughs> is hey, I have oh, a question. Man. Is the Optimus Views yeah. pen called an L pen? No, it's called a rubber diem. Okay, because it should be called an L pen. It, it would be great if it was called an L pen. Yeah. <laughs> That's the one thing that uh, LG has not latched onto is taking the L initial and just putting it in front of various nouns. Yes, they've got Q. Uh, somebody in the, the 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 mobile show chat was uh, referencing a rumor that they might do uh, Q voice or something to make. Well, oh to wait, no, hang on. That's a thing. Q voice is a thing uh, oh, is in, it? in Korea. Already? Yeah, hang on. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, in Korea. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, back in July, yes. LG renames Quick Voice tool Q Voice with English version set for early next year. Perfect. So, boom. So, you have the Q pen. You have, yeah, this is great. This is perfect. Why Q? Where did, why, like, whatever. I, I think it comes from the quick. Like, they were yeah. like, they're like, we're going to do a quick voice. And then, like, oh, wait, no, we, we don't need the rest of the U I C K. Just, <laughs> you know, drop that, make a Q voice. And, and, uh, Makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I guess the last thing is we, speaking of like finally getting release dates and prices, we've got the Razer HD and Razer HD Max uh, October 18th in the US. Um, and it's $199 and $299, which I don't know if we knew those prices before, but that's exactly what we expected. Yep. Uh, we called you know, them. They're sliding them into their price points. Yeah. So. Yeah. And and by the way, the notion of paying a hundred extra dollars for the Max is insane. Yeah, you're paying a hundred bucks more for battery life. That's it. Yeah, which is like you know, We're, it's insane. But like, why would you buy the other one at, at the same token? Yeah, uh, it's got internal memory. <laughs> um, memory. I'm does, telling you, man. I was, I was looking up. Does the, so the Max has more more internal storage? Is is that what we? Yeah. Okay. Oh, double. Okay, yeah, I see. Double the internal storage. Okay, still, it's a hundred bucks. But like, then again, why would you buy the other one? Is is like on a on a two year contract, you know, a uh, hundred bucks to to you know make a big stink over a hundred bucks between a phone when you're paying you know two grand over a two year contract is kind of like 
you might as well have that phone at least last all day. You say that, but yeah. it's like I, I really feel that um, – I mean, like, think about any other product. Like, there's a big difference between 199 and 200. Like, I get the logic that spread over two years, it's nothing. But you think you have to think about it in terms of like, I'm going into the into a store and spending either 200 or 300 dollars today. Right. So that that's mm-hmm. still, I I think that for a lot of buyers, that's still like a major factor. You know, it, it's for the same. I mean, like, for the same reason that there's an iPhone 16, 32, and 64. I mean, of course, you'd like the 64. But I bet the 32 and 16 both outsell it. Oh yeah, well the the most best selling one is the 16. Yeah, yeah. and and fr- personally, I can't bring myself to spend 400 dollars for a phone on contract. So yeah, I guess that proves the point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I used to go for the the 64 uh, on the iPhone, um, and I used to care a lot about having a ton of internal storage. I don't even know what I've got on mine anymore because I don't care anymore because I don't load it up with music. I just use audio and I don't pay attention. Exactly. Well, you know, to, to, some... to a point, to a point that makes sense. But when you've got big, uh, big apps and big games, you yeah. do want to have some, like you're not going to go down to an eight gigabyte device. Uh, yeah, no, I've got 32 gig. Right. So, My, so you, you're going to want to have some space, but it's not as big of a concern as it used to be. That's for sure. The only time where it's, it's a problem for me because I, I, I'm with you hundred percent Dieter. Um, I, I got the, uh, the 16 gig and, uh, didn't look back. I use Mog exclusively for music now. Um, and in fact, like I, I was only using like two gig of the internal storage. The only problem is that that I can see is that if you're going like on an international flight or something and you want two or three movies to rent, each one is between four and five gig. So that's where you start to run, yeah. run into problems. But otherwise it's to, like, there's that, no problem with this. That, that was the exact reason that I bought the 16 gigabyte Nexus seven was because I was like, I want to use this on movies or on, t- on planes and I want to be able to watch, you know, one or two movies. Yeah. And that was the exact reason that I did. Yep. Um, can I point out two things? Three sure. things. I want to point out three things. Uh, one, Skype is the worst, <laughs> and it uh, switched my mic input uh, to the wrong microphone randomly, um, which is awesome. Uh, two, it's insanely hot in the Verge West office, and I don't know if I can uh, handle it anymore. But normally, it's not insanely hot in the Verge West office. And if you want to work in the Verge West office, we just put up uh, a job listing. We're hiring out here. Are you, are you going to pass out? I am gonna pass out. I'm because uh, that would be very entertaining to do that during the show. <laughs> that makes for great. Well, it'd be, it'd be a nice, uh, you know, book bookend to the, the opening where I, you know, pretended <laughs> that I was. Is it is for, it like their ninety degrees birthday. in San Francisco again? Is is that what's happening? Yeah, it's that's I, because we had frost understand. here in New York this week, like frost. It is. Yeah, it's seventy five degrees uh, right now. Uh, and since I have to have everything all closed up here for the show, it's probably like approaching 90 in the office. So he, awesome. here's what happened. Somebody saw that you were about to die. Like they were watching the show like, oh, Dieter's about to die because it's really hot. So we're going to post yeah. his job on the board right now. So we're ready <laughs> with a replacement as soon as he dies. That's what's, that's what's going on here. Yeah. Um, I'm not even going to call attention to what's happening in the chat right now. Um <laughs> I, so, okay, Razer Max HD, like if you can spend the extra hundred bucks, you should, because I've held them both. And unless you're actually holding them and feeling their weight, if you're looking at it from more than a foot away, you literally cannot tell the difference. Like it is the, the Razer HD is not that thin and the Razer HD Max or is it Magic Max HD, whatever, uh, is like a millimeter thicker. It's barely thicker. Um, so, uh, you know, despite... You know, the fact that it's a penthouse screen and, you know, a, f- a few other problems that I have with the software, but not that many, surprisingly. Um, it's not launching with Jellybean, which is insane and annoying because Google owns this company. Um, I'm actually kind of like the idea of a phone that has literally 22 hours of talk time is pretty exciting for me because I'm um, iPhone 5, this LG, the One X, the Galaxy S3. Um, if I push any of them uh, super hard, I can't get through a day. And the idea that I could just not care um, is pretty exciting. Well, like I'm imagining having this phone at CES and just not worrying about my battery life. 
Well, to, to, to your point, Dieter, uh, you know, when the, when the original Razer Max came out uh, and people would ask me, I'm on Verizon, what phone should I buy? I, I don't want the iPhone, I want something with LTE. I, I inevitably told them to buy the Razer Max because for an average user, it provided a good enough experience and like I would not hear them complaining that the battery life was terrible like they would with any other phone. Uh, and so I think that with the Razer HD Max, it's going to be a lot of the same uh, uh, where, you know, if, if you want an Android phone on Verizon, uh, right now, given what we know, because we don't know exactly what Nexus phones are going to come out or how they are going to perform, uh, you know, the, the HD Max is very tempting for that reason yeah. that you just don't have to worry about it. If you want any phone on any carrier that's not the iPhone, uh, you should wait uh, for like a couple of weeks to so yes. that we know exactly what's happening with Windows Phone. We know what's happening with the Nexus, um, you know. Because right now, like, there's there's some really good stuff that have, has been announced and that's coming out, um, but there's stuff that might be better, um, like significantly better, that could be coming out relatively soon. Um, I I mean, yeah, you should not buy a phone today, unless it's an iPhone, and that's what you really want. Pretty yeah. much, period. Yeah. And even um, even then, you might want to uh, just wait a couple of weeks if you desperately can. Yeah. Because you never know. I mean, I don't oh, know. Hey, crap, maybe I, maybe the Galaxy S3 is still a safe recommendation as a, as a solid. Like, if you absolutely oh, yeah. had to buy an Android phone today, it would probably be the GS3, right? Yes. Yeah. If, if someone put a gun to my head and was like, I'm walking you down to the store and you're buying an Android phone, it would be the GS3. That would be the weirdest hold up <laughs> ever, by the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I totally Touché. forgot about the pad phone, just yes. like the rest of the world. But it's uh, the pad phone too. Uh, Vlad went and got a preview of it, and it's like, it's not bad, right? You know, Vlad, I think really likes this. It's unfortunate that he's uh, actually traveling back from the pad phone two event, and he, and he hasn't been yet been able to join us here. But if you read his preview um, uh, of the the device, he actually really likes it. He really likes the screen. Uh, he says it's right yeah. up there with the One X. Um, you know, as a phone, he likes it. I think he still, and he made this point that as a tablet, uh, and then eventually as a laptop, it's still got some really software issues and kinks that need to be worked out, just like the original iP uh, pad phone did. But if you're buying it just as a phone, um, you're getting the same uh, quad core chip that w was in the uh, Optimus G. Uh, yep. A 13 megapixel camera again. Um, yep. The uh, 720p display that is actually using Sharp's IGZO technology uh which is the first one of the first devices that we've seen to use it um and and you know a really solid looking device it's super thin it's got a nice build quality so i mean there's a lot to like here what kind of bizarre world are we in now where asus and lg are making phones with uh you know the latest processor that uh, other guys don't have yet and incredibly good screens and decent software like i i'm really confused well, what what was bizarre about it for so many years was that LG made so many of the screens and it couldn't put a good one in its phones. <laughs> right. Uh, so yeah. now it's finally just like, well, we're going to put them in our own phone. Um, but yeah, as far as like uh, Asus is concerned, this is is not something I would have expected to see 18 months ago or even a year ago for that matter. Yeah. So so I, I hate to be the uh, the wet blanket on this love parade for the pad phone too. Um, and Vlad could probably um, shoot me down here somewhat effectively but but from the pictures that that he he posted it looks to me like there's just an enormous amount of black area below the screen i you know i, I thought the same thing to be honest with you when i saw the pictures yeah and above uh, for that matter. especially it's, the side by side with yeah. the one x that, like, yeah, that he posted yeah from, from the front of the phone it looks like a mid-range device just because the screen looks very small relative to this to the outline of the device itself that's complaint number one complaint number two is that i still don't understand this concept like WTF like why <laughs> why are we putting why are we putting phones in tablets when we can just have a phone and a tablet like no one has effectively explained it. I know you guys have tried but I I'm gonna try again it. okay it's because it just carries if you can, if it carries you can sell your data me the data tablet it carries your yeah, data you can right sell over. me the tablet yeah yeah if you can sell a tablet for like a hundred bucks or like 75 bucks, no like uh, Motorola tried screen. to do that with the lap dock and it like failed well, miserably I yeah, mean, this is this the is the. It's, I mean, this is the lap dock idea, right? Uh, where you eventually get yeah. your phone all the way to a laptop, uh, and the phone is is powering uh, the the whole shebang because it's got this really you know modern, up to date processor. Um, but the software steps to get there don't exist really uh, to make it a, a viable platform. Right. 
Yeah, it's it's just right. it's it's so like so I I think that sh- the that shared data plans kind of alleviate some of what you were talking about, Dan. Like you know a, a year ago that may have been more true, but now like if you're on a mobile share plan or uh, w- whatever Verizon's equivalent is called, I can't remember, then that that becomes less of an issue. Um, but then also, some people say, well, you know, you have the giant battery and the tablet that can power that can you know charge the phone. Yes, that's true, but there are also like a million other ways to charge your phone. <laughs> so I was thinking about mobile share over the weekend, and I got really, really angry. <laughs> Did you start throwing? Why things? do I have? Yeah, why do I have to pay an extra ten bucks to put another device on my mobile share plan, or twenty bucks? Oh, it's a great like, question. Just, yeah, just charge me for the data that I'm using. Like, could you imagine if you had to pay Comcast an extra ten bucks just to turn on another computer in your house? Well, you know, for to that point, Comcast will charge you more money if you want another cable box in your house. But but it's their equip. You're renting. You're physically renting a piece yeah, of equipment. Yeah, from that's them. a good point. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 outrageous. Uh, but so is a lot of what AT and T and Verizon <laughs> do. So, I mean, well, I mean, nobody's doing it. Nobody's offering. You know, here's pay us a hundred bucks a month, and we'll give you, you know, four gigs of data that you can use on whatever you want, however you want. Like nobody's doing that. I mean, it's technically. Like, Technically, if you want to get really technical about it, you can use that data wherever you want on AT and T by moving the SIM around, which actually, well, Dieter, well, they're yeah. trying to make uh, <laughs> they're trying to make difficult on you. Yeah, no, I I have a forum post uh, with, a, and I actually have a statement from AT and T. I just haven't written it yet, but uh, provisioning phones in AT and T is a huge pain now because you can't. To have all the features on the iPhone 5 work, you need to be on a mobile share plan and you need to call them and have them provision it to the IMEI, the unique identifier for the actual phone hardware, so that mobile hotspot and FaceTime will work. Uh, If you take that SIM card out and stick it in an Android phone or, I don't know, a a Palm Pre, I mean, whatever, whatever other smartphone that uses data that you want, a Windows phone, um, the phone calling will work, but the data will not. You need to call them and have it be provisioned off of the special iPhone plan and onto the Android or, you know, other generic data plans so that data will work there. Now, that's the way it's actually always been. Um, But what seemed... and. I thought it was di- I thought it was different before, but AT and T tells me it's not. Is if it's provisioned as a you know generic data device to Android, Windows Phone, whatever, uh, you used to be able to stick it in an iPhone and have those other features work. Um, but that's not the case now, and I guess it wasn't the case before. So if you want a like officially sanctioned mobile hotspot on an iPhone and AT and T, you've got to be on an AT and T plan. And if you want data to work at all on a non-iPhone smartphone, you need to be provisioned there. So what used to be really simple swim, SIM swapping is now you put the SIM in, you call AT&T, you wait for 10 minutes, you talk to somebody, you say, hey, I've, I'm in a different phone now, provision me. Now, like, I'm all worked up about this, but this is not a problem that 99% of people have. Um, but it's still like, I mean, that's AT&T it's really it's not, a, it's a not one percenter problem there, Dieter. That you, you've right, heard. but it's it's the the principle behind it is um, you know AT and T isn't treating their devices agnostically. It's you know you need to call them and get the provision for the specific data plan for the specific phone that you have, and um, that's like it's in the same vein as why am I you know having to pay for each device going on you know my data bucket. Uh, I get that there's a certain amount of load that goes on the network for having another device registered on it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, like, I know it's not going to change anytime soon, especially because it's a big revenue stream. Um, but uh, I want the carriers to be more like dumb pipes, and I want them to treat the stuff that connects to their network uh, equally. And uh, this is a tiny little step in the wrong direction. Yeah, it, I mean, it's 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 really, like, just... The carriers are fighting becoming that dumb pipe that, you know, we would like them to be and would hope eventually that they become. Uh, But they're going to do everything they can to stop that from happening. And having you requiring you to actually call them to interact with them to switch a device uh, is is just one more way to do that. And the funny thing is that they carriers fight so hard to reduce the amount of time that customers need to spend on the phone with them. <laughs> like, it, uh, I remember at MWC, I had a discussion with, uh, oh, the name of the company escapes me. What What is the, um, shoot, what, what is the, the company? Oh, that, they, they made that hotspot thing, that one you talked about? No, no, the the, the company that uh, that got into uh, hot water for um, transmitting all your keys. Oh, Carrier IQ. Carrier, thank Carrier you. IQ. Carrier IQ. Yeah. So, 
Um, you know, their their real business model uh, is not uh, being evil. It's actually, um, uh, you know, coming up with these metrics that carriers can use to like tweak service and like fix towers that are aren't performing optimally and this and that and the other thing. Um, and uh, th they were in the process of rolling out these new tools uh, that were actu actually customer facing tools so that a, a carrier would roll these out to its customers and they would be able to log into like this portal and see all these stats on like how many drop calls you've had and like why the calls were dropped. Things that like, you know, customers probably call into customer service for all the time. And it's just, there's nothing that customer service can do. It's just, it, it's kind of like wasting their time. So that was Carrier IQ's proposition to carriers is give them access to this information. They will, they will call you less. And carriers are always looking for ways, self-help tools, those sorts of things to, to make it so that you don't have to get in contact with them because that costs them money every time you do call them. So here you have a very, seemingly a really easy thing for them to say, you know, well, we're just going to use one APN for all of our devices. And then that way, like, we stay true to the spirit of GSM. You can move your SIM around just like you're supposed to be able to. And what do you know? We also don't get a, we don't generate a support call. Like, and instead they're, you know, they're, they're throwing that advantage away just because they want to, I mean, I'm sure they have some technical, some, you know, random technical reason why they're doing it this way. But in reality, let's be honest, there's no reason that FaceTime over cellular can't run over the existing APN. Well, I mean, I would, I would like to know how uh, European carriers would handle it uh, because that's a perfect example. Like, yeah. you know, people can switch from an iPhone to a uh, Galaxy S3 if they want in the UK. I highly doubt they have to call O2 to switch it over. Right. Um, so, yeah, maybe there's a technical reason, but does it really need to be a technical reason? Right. And on that depressing note, I have nothing else. You guys, is there anything you guys want to do? We, do we want to talk about ISIS? I don't really want to. I mean, it, I'll, you know, it's coming yeah. finally, maybe. The, the, the maybe logo looks morning. like the Nespresso logo, but I, I already mentioned it. <laughs> um, I, I, actually, I, I don't think that's the ISIS logo. That's just the um, that's the NFC logo that AT&T is using. Um, yeah. yeah, it's awful. Yeah, I guess um, I'm just looking through our, our other news items for the week. Um, yeah. Oh, you know what? We should touch. You guys are going to kill me for this, but I, I do think we should touch briefly on the iPod Touch review. Because, okay. um, you know, th there used to be this running joke that like a really, really common like device combo for business people was a BlackBerry in one hand and an iPod Touch in the other or an iPod. Not not even an iPod Touch, but just an iPod of some sort. Um, and and I, I, you know. Uh, this is still, I think, a really compelling product for a lot of people who, for one reason or another, uh, for an, or another, either want a non-iPhone or need to have a non-iPhone, probably for business, uh, but still want, uh, you know, still want access to all that iPhone stuff, and uh, and this looks like a really sweet device. I, I'm I'm really excited that they're bringing colors to it. You know, I, I yeah, think I think it's incredible. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a gorgeous device and it's really well made, uh, and the th it's like incredibly thin. Uh, it's you, insane you, how you, thin it is. You can't like appreciate how thin it is until you actually hold it, um, which is we say every single time, but uh, it, it's really the the truth here. Um, I think with the colors, I think that Apple identified a target audience for this um, with that. You know, this is a huge device that teenagers love uh, and parents love for teenagers because they don't have to pay for a data plan on it and they don't have to pay uh, for another line on their cellular plan. They can give the kid a prepaid phone, take the school in emergencies, and then uh, their kid has all their games and apps and iMessage and everything on their iPod Touch. And I think these colors, uh, you know, just speak to that as well. That you know, the kids will, will eat this up. Right. So what makes what makes me wonder about the iPod Touch is why aren't we seeing these colors on the iPhone? And I think the answer is probably it's it's probably just like everything else bad that happens in the world it's probably the carriers right like i i don't well, think schemes, no right? no i don't i don't think it's the carriers because you don't? i i think i think apple would do it regardless if it wanted to or not if it wanted to put colors on the iphone i think it would do it i don't think the carriers have the the that kind of clout over over uh, apple's design philosophy um but yeah it's a good question as to why we don't see it in the iphone unless they're just trying to uh separate a premium versus a slightly less premium line 
But well, that, I, I think that the, the number of phones that they need to produce is huge, and they want to bring costs down by, uh, from that volume. Um, and I think it's also multiple SKUs. You know, it's it's one thing to offer you know four different colors at Best Buy. It's another thing to try and you know get Verizon to have those colors stocked in their stores. It's it's a it's an entirely you know if if you don't have the color you want. Uh, at Best Buy, it's out of stock, you know, whatever. But if they don't have the color you want at Verizon, I mean, you know, the idea that they would have to stock all of those different multiple models when these, you know, all these companies have gotten, done such a good job of minimizing the amount of inventory that they have to carry. Uh, I think that it, it's, you know, it's possible, but I think that um, they save a ton of money by not doing it. Yeah. Both Apple and the carriers. That, that is a very good point. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's kind of bad that I want I I own an iPhone and I carry an iPhone, but I still want one of these iPod touches. <laughs> can you imagine? Can you imagine if the iPhone five was the thickness? In fact, I can already tell you, not the five S, but the iPhone six. They're going to be like, good news. We made the iPhone as thin as our old iPod Touch now. And and, and Chris is just going to die inside because he just really wanted more battery life. Yeah, I mean like. I would still rather have an iPhone. Well, maybe not now, like now that I'm used to it. But like a couple of weeks ago, I just wanted a phone that was the thickness of the 4S with more battery life. And now they've gotten me used to the stupid 7.1. <laughs> like, you know, they're going to keep making it thinner. I'll be like, oh, this is stupid. Then I'll use it for all. I'll be like, oh, this is actually pretty cool. And then, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like it's it's a vicious cycle. Anyway, I'm just I'm I'm saying nothing of importance. Can we now. talk a little bit about the loop? Because I would kind of love the loop on my iPhone. The uh oh wait you would I think it'd be rad yeah I don't know Landed wait loops are a big deal man oh, in what circumstance <laughs> just explain to me Dan <laughs> under what circumstance you would use the loop you know what I would do is because the button depresses uh to go it's a push push button yeah I would just play with it all day long like oh, it would be yeah. sitting on my desk and I'd be like click 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 yeah. click 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 and that's probably the real reason that I want it yeah no that's fair. That's that's totally fair. You know, I'm just realizing, uh, looking at the bottom of the uh, the iPod Touch here, they physically can't make it much thinner because of the uh, the the diameter of the three and a half millimeter jack. Yep. They're they're almost uh, getting to the point where they're they're hitting that limit. And what really Wasn't worries me about that? there some insane patent where they had like a, a a jack that was like half rubber and half metal, and then it could it could expand out when you plugged it in, but it would reduce down to the a thinner form factor. I swear I saw a patent from Apple on that like four years ago. Well, probably. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, but but I, I can totally imagine Apple uh, just going with a proprietary jack. I mean, they basically went with a proprietary headphone jack with the first generation right. iPhone for all practical yeah. purposes. I can, I can see them. If, if at some point they decide that they really need, need to make like a four millimeter thick phone, uh, I could totally see them saying, well, we're just going to have to go with a one millimeter wide uh, jack and everyone's going to have to deal or, with it. Or, the, you know, they would eliminate the wire entirely and, and use some sort of wireless. Yeah. Yeah. They could use, yeah. They could use Aptex or something. But <laughs> four millimeter right, thick phone. I'm just trying to think about how <laughs> insane <laughs> that would be. <laughs> it's like yeah, no, three they, business the cards. The that came out uh, last year in 2011. What did? Um, the 3.5, cutting a 3.5 jack in half. <laughs> Oh, the uh, the patent. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so in uh, other words, what you're telling me is that this is going to happen. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Um, that's the Verge Mobile Show, everybody. We want to thank you so much for watching or listening, but preferably watching because uh, the men in the studio are quite handsome. If you want to email us, you can. Uh, it is mobileshow at theverge.com. If you want to follow us on Twitter, you totally should. Uh, I'm at Backlon. Chris is at Z Power. Dan is at DC Seifert, spelled E I. Uh, we are together at Verge, and we'll be back next week. Hopefully with, with more Vlad. mobile news. Hopefully with and Vlad. With Vlad yeah. Who is Vlad Savov, I believe, on Twitter. And you should follow him too. And uh, we'll be happy to have him. And. Goodbye. Thanks for watching. Thanks, guys. See ya.